It's 11 past eight on breakfast. Our guest this morning is ABC journalist Matt Peacock. He's just released a book called Killer Company. It's the saga of asbestos in this country and the company that brought it to us, James Hardy. And Matt, you mentioned Bernie Banton. It was really, I mean, he's obviously James Hardy's most famous victim. He really won the PR war here. You, you came to know him quite well through all of this. Would we be where we are today in terms of acknowledgement of the dangers of asbestos and the funds available for those people suffering from the fallout from it, if not for Bernie Banton? I don't think so. And I think the reason being that Bernie was a natural at the media and media is the one thing that this company has always done extremely well. Uh, the reason why I got involved in the first place was because one of their spinners rang up and I got suspicious. But um, if you go to the websites of most, a uh, couple of the leading um, PR companies at the moment, you'll find uh, testimonials from uh, Meredith Helicar saying how good they are in a crisis and Greg Baxter, oh, I've used this company for years, it's really good. Um, these are, this is the skill of the company, was spin, and Bernie outspanned them essentially and that's what brought it undone. And two of the strongest uh, stories in your book, I think, revolve around Bernie. For a start, there's the, the shameful story about, about him in the book. Um, he and two of his brothers were afflicted with dust disease. Uh, but there was actually what's been uncovered is there was an X-ray taken of Bernie Banton when he was in his 20s. He went on keeping on working in asbestos for, for a few years after that. So people knew he was ill and he didn't know. Not unusual. Um, the doctor, Dr Terry McCulloch, I've run into a lot of people who've said, look, you know, it was only later that they discovered it. Because Hardy did these X-rays and everything, but they kept them to themselves basically and uh, a lot of people have said look I only found out later that uh, you know it showed signs of asbestosis but I was never told. The other story which I haven't got to hand right now but of they used to have reunions company reunions mm. Bernie and you know a mm. hundred so other mates once a year would get together but over the time those mm. numbers just dropped off quite quickly. Well the last one that Bernie attended was the year before his death and um, it was just him and another mate. Basically, and do we know how many of those? I mean, that died was the from... real factory of death. That was the one that made the insulation that's killed people in the power stations. And Sir David Martin, you remember on the warship on the uh, in the Royal Navy, um, that was James Hardy BI that made those products, and that really did kill people big time. There's you know photos in the book which show the, the mounds of um, asbestos dust and kids playing in them, and but the the thing that you, you pointed out in your seven thirty report story last night, and it's a really staggering photo when you look at it, is um, the notion of the bags, the Hessian bags that transported the um, asbestos. This is killer material. There's kids playing um, sack races in these asbestos bags up at um, Barriugal, I think. Wittenham it was. That was the CSR-owned mine. But certainly the bags have killed people wherever they've gone. And this is an untold story, really. I mean, we didn't know about the sacks killing yeah. people. And it's, we knew about the wives washing their husbands' overalls. Yeah, well, wherever you go, you, you can go to the banana growers up in Queensland used to wrap the bananas in these uh, sacks after they'd been used at Hardy's. They, the guy used to go down and pick them up and pay for them, mind you. Hardy never gave things away. And uh, there's a string of banana growers who died from it. Fruit sellers in Victoria markets, wheat farmers over in the West that got their superphosphate in it, and under the carpets. And under the carpets. I mean, that's the frightening revelation at the end of the book is it's still there, lurking, because well, a lot of these sacks were churned up, made into carpet underlay, put into houses, I suppose, up until the mid-70s. Yeah, that's right. Well, Hardy itself did tests on these things. They were clean, but it didn't clean them enough. There were still dangerous levels of dust. And uh, and I noted this from 1971, a Hardy... Um, the minutes of their environmental meeting said uh, one of their managers was walking through the Brooklyn factory in Melbourne and said, uh, what are those bags doing? Oh, they're going off to be used as carpet underlay. But you see, the point of, point of that, it may not have killed very many people. We won't know, really, because if you think about it, if it went on to the 60s, say the 70s, how long does carpet last? I mean, you don't rip it up until what, 10, 15 years? And we don't know yet of anyone who's contracted mesothelioma from underlay. Yet, no, but there's it? two points about that. Firstly, who would think of it? You know, you get a mesothelioma to go down, oh, it's another mesothelioma not caused by asbestos. Now, these so-called environmental mesos I'm very suspicious of. The more you look, the more you do find that asbestos connection. But the other thing is that if you've ripped up your carpet, say, 1975, 1980, you've got to wait 40 years before you'll know if you get the meso on average. And um, it might be in, in you and you wouldn't know. There has been movement in the last few years and uh, last week, of course, James Hardy executives were fined and banned from running companies, several of them, many of them. Um, it's out in the open. We know that asbestos is dangerous now, but that lag time, does it mean 
people are going to keep on dying? And do we have any sense of the of epidemic's how many? still peaking? We still don't know when it's going to end. It's still climbing, and uh, you know this has been an ongoing story. I mean, the the PRs at Hardy's were telling me back in the seventies, oh, it'll all be over by the nineteen eighties, and they've been wrong then. They're probably still wrong, and the question is how many other places we're going to find it that we don't really know about. And that's the whole point. The company never told you. I mean, one of the other things that the company doctor pointed out around the time of the jute bags going into the carpet underlay is he discovered that they were sending them off to the Old Age Pensioners Association to collect clothing in. Uh, But that's not quite as bad, I suppose, because the company had tried to get... uh, old people hired as factory labour because they'd be dead before they got their mesos and I guess pensioners would be too. Just finally, Matt, the Jackson Commission talked about the cor- corporate culture of deceit um, many decades ago in, in, in James Hardy. Have things changed? Has James Hardy still had there. the wake-up call yet? Still there, still there. I mean, um, even in this ASIC prosecution, you haven't noticed uh, the company directors saying, oh, yes, I'm sorry, uh, you know, it's true, the press release that we put out was... Uh, misleading and deceitful. They've denied that. Uh, Meredith Helica and a lot of them said, we didn't even approve those board meetings, which I find, as the judge found, very hard to believe. Uh, in Meredith's case, it was unfortunate. They found phone records of a, a hookup the, the following day to see how, how the board results had gone. And, huh? What? Fo- oh, that phone call. OK, Matt, good on you. Thanks very much. Matt Peacock, ABC journalist, these days working for the 7.30 Report, of course. His book is Killer Company, James Hardy Exposed, published by ABC Books. And uh, no one in the world perhaps knows more about all this than Matt Peacock. He's been working on this story since the 70s. It's 18 past 8 on breakfast, and take care when you're pulling up that underlay.